Um, hello everyone, uh, this is Wen Lei. Uh, I'm a research scientist from Meta working on PyTorch. So today I'm going to talk about the Torch Arrow, which tries to provide performant ML pre-processing um, to, the, to the machine learning ecosystem. So these days we are always talking about AI, um, but if we look down enough, AI is really about data processing in when launching production workloads. So essentially, we have uh, logging, try and uh, and try to log in the data, ingest them into your data warehouse solutions, and then before you really can train or serve in your data, uh, serve in your model with those data, you would first have to do feature preparations, sometimes also known as offline feature engineering. So which it could be uh, doing aggregations like counting the movie uh, with their recent likes or what are their recent uh, rates for the movie or the user or the videos. It can also be applying certain uh, feature transformations like uh, applying the bucketize transformation or just a hash it. And then um, still before the before you really need to train, uh, still before you really need, can train and serve the data, you often need to do this last mile pre-processing which um, and then convert to tensor. So all those transformations are those are CQ-like in a sense that it looks like uh, um, very similar to what you are doing with your warehouse solution or writing a CQ. Now, after those transformations, that this is the time you can really convert it to tensor and turning on the auto grad and uh, you know applying the model and uh, either training or evaluate uh, the model with the matrix multiplications and uh, uh, other operations. So in this case, uh, we will say for for the neural network part, uh, for all those you know matrix multiplication style data processing, those are done with a PyTorch to train and to serve your model. However, there was one part for those CQ-like transformations. Um, that's what what we want to cover today by Torch Arrow, and especially for recommend for for certain domains like recommendation domains, um, the the, uh, the feature engineering can be also quite important compared with models. So it's indeed an important problem. Um, so uh, so we, we have talked about the offline feature transformations as, as well as this last mile pre-processing. And as I said, the last mile pre-processing is really saying uh, after you Read uh, after everything is ready, you start to train your job. You read the data from warehouse, apply some you know more lightweight uh, pre-processing, and convert to tensor before you feed it to trainer. So compared with this feature preparation step, which is kind of uh, done offline, you know, as a batch job, uh, this last mile pre-processing is kind of like doing online, and uh, um, right right before it. And today's talk will be focusing on this last mile pre-processing because for the uh, offline pre-processing, uh, there are already decent solutions uh, provided by your warehouse uh, warehouse vendor or by open source solutions such as Press or Spark. So one question would be, hey, uh, why do we need to separate this last mile pre-processing? Why cannot we just push them into this offline feature engineering because they look so similar uh, and uh, and it already has you know good solutions today. So the answer is uh, those last mile pre-processing are often much closer to the model. So it allows the machine learning engineers to f to f do the fine tune their model together with pre-proc uh, simultaneously. So for example, you might want imagine a machine learning engineer want to tune the model and try to add in a few layers. Uh, uh, to, to the neural networks. And uh, in order to really maximize the benefits, he, he or she also needs to, you know, change, change a little bit about uh, the final step in the feature pre-processing. So uh, this is often done in an online fashion to get the best iteration result. So now we bring this structured data processing problem in the neural network training. And uh, so those are tabular style pre-processings uh, and uh, often in different domains, it can mean very different things. In the recommendation domain, it also often means a dense or sparse feature transformations. 
So uh, to give some concrete examples, the bucketized transformation tries to convert a dense feature and discretize it into a sparse feature. So you can do the embedding table lookup. And the feature hash um, is always applying to the sparse feature to kind of reduce the space. And uh, finally, uh, things like ID overlap, uh, uh, you know, often applies to a list of sparse features to try to compute the uh, similarity between, you know, two items and so on. Similarly, in the text domain, we have a lot of those string manipulation operations. So thinking it as, you know, you start with a sentence, you want to tokenize it or split it by some regular expressions. And then uh, you need to do some padding, either some padding or trim operations. So normalize string. So you can do vocabulary lookup and finally convert them into tensors and uh, to apply your uh, favorite model such as BERT. How is it done today? So a very straightforward way uh, we have seen done in the PyTorch ecosystem is by using the Py, uh, you know, Python dictionary or lists. So, uh, and, uh, and this works really well with, uh, you know, PyTorch data loadings. Uh, the problem here is, Thinking it as kind of doing this low oriented processing, and you also have to pay the Python interpreter cost. And uh, as a result, especially we have observed uh, on those GPU machines with very powerful computation powers, um, pre processing could be become a bottleneck. In other words, you can you don't you cannot provide enough throughput to you know saturate the trainer and the waste of the uh, uh, waste the computation resource. And uh, this efficient problem of low oriented process is kind of a very uh, standard problem in the, you know, either uh, data database domain. And we all know the, the solution is column style processing, which has been applied successfully for decades in both scientific computing domain and the big data area. So indeed, uh, we have we have actually seen people when they try to accelerate their pre proc they encoding a batch of data into a column format by using tensor. It actually works well for numerical columns because after all, a integer columns can also be viewed just as a one D uh, one dimension tensor. And uh, the pain points starts with a string column and the variable width column. And for string columns because in PyTorch there is no, you know, string D type. So there is no natural representations here. For variable width columns, um, such as thinking about, you know, the uh, CQ's array type, the problem is you have to uh, manually encoding them uh, into, for example, two tensors. One is the flattened element tensor, and another is either the offset tensor or length tensor. So it's kind of like uh, you are trying to represent the data with the uh, er under the lying arrow, uh, arrow buffer. So it comes a problem like uh, uh, what's the standard, uh, uh, what's the standard decoding, right? So some UDFs may expect a length instead of an offset. So we often see in user, user has to uh, glue those uh, conventions together by you know, manually subtract the offset to derive the length or vice versa. And the things becomes even more complicated if you have, you know, an array of array. And here is now, uh, you know, arrows, uh, arrow data format come into the place because arrow has already established as a, you know, a wildly used uh, uh, in memory layout in the industry for column data. And uh, in this slide, I will try to give a very high level overview about Torch Arrow as a structured data in PyTorch ecosystem. And uh, we will talk about uh, uh, some details with examples in the following up slide. So first, uh, we try to design uh, Touch Arrow as a Python data frame library inspired uh, by pandas because we have because of the you know popular of pandas in the both machine learning and data science community. But we try to make uh, some uh, we, we try to make certain structured data support uh, um, in a more native way, such as especially for nested array and struct, which we have seen a lot in the recommendation domain or text domain. And uh, uh, the, uh, the data is backed by the arrow, for, arrow native C++ format. So this allows more efficient kernels implemented. Uh, 
um, and of course we want to uh, support it uh, because we want to support in the data loading effort. So it uh, it has the very seamless handoffs with PyTorch or other model authoring. And we are uh, this is done with the PyTorch data loader V2 with a very natural integration of Torch Arrow with the data pipe. Arrow format is becoming quite a a popular both in the machine learning and the data processing domain. So uh, we designed it uh, with the arrow in memory format, which allows zero copy from external readers. So when, one way to think about it, you can use the pyarrow.parquet to read it from your data and uh, uh, you know without any overhead, hand it to touch arrow data free. Multi, uh, we do want to have multiple execution runtime supports. So first, uh, as the very first step, uh, we have a high performance CPU backend, uh, which is backed by the Velox, which we, um, and uh, to support, uh, to support, uh, you know, the uh, more efficient uh, processing at, uh, at very large scale in uh, meta production, uh, we actually, we also implement a graph mode. The idea is we try to trace the torch arrow program and into some, you know, standard uh, relational IR, which allows us for optimization and lowering to other, you know, distributed uh, engines that is very scalable. Uh, this part is not open source yet, but we are also exploring how can we, you know, engage this with the community. Um, another, uh, and, and the, the finally, we also want to talk up, uh, and finally, as a future work, we also want to have a GPU backend because uh, a lot of pre proc are become very efficient in a GPU machine. And, uh, you know, we also have, you, uh, make it very extensible with the Velox UDF uh, mechanism, which is uh, high efficient and supports vectorization. Okay, so now let's go into some uh, a detailed example. So I will use the example of the Cryteo dataset. Uh, this is uh, one of the largest uh, dataset in the open source for recommendation uh, use case and for researchers to test and benchmark their models. So the original data is stored in a TSV format with 40 fields in each line. And for each instance, it contains, you know, a label column, which is zero when indicates whether this is a neg in, uh, positive uh, instance or negative instance. It also contains 13 dense features. So dense features are mostly counting features, thinking it as some li something like, you know, the views or, you know, the number of likes, similar to that. And uh, it also contains 26 categorical features. And in recommendation domain, those features means uh, the properties, like uh, some kind of properties, which is very sparse for each uh, item. And uh, the, this category feature is already hashed for privacy consideration. So first, uh, and uh, you know, uh, very natural as a data set uh, for for each part it may contain some missing values which is nat naturally represented by no in the cq so to represent the data we first try to convert the tsv file into uh, some kind of more efficient uh, binary format such as parquet and we model the dense fe both dense features and the categorical features as a nested struct so the parquet file thinking it has has three fields the label field, uh, which is just a integer field, and a dense feature column, which is a nested struct with 13 subfields. And finally, the categorical features, which is kind of like a var binary or integer, um, sorry, each value is kind of like a bin var binary or integer, but it's a nested struct with 26 six, uh, fields. So what's the pre-processing criteria data set look like? So here is a very concrete example used in the uh, used in an open source DLRM model. Uh, so first, uh, we want to you know fill in the no values. Uh, in this example, we always fill in the no value into zero. So uh, the zero the no here becomes zero in dense features, and the no here becomes uh, also zero 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 because it's already hashed hex. And the second, uh, now we try to apply different transformations for dense features and the categorical features. For the dense features, uh, we want to apply this. First, we add in each value with three and then um, take the log of it. So in this part, uh, this is what I described as, you can try to fine tune the, uh, 
the model with, with for example, different constant, uh, maybe, for example, plus four or plus five is the best option. Or you can try different transformations. Like we have also seen, you know, besides log, like logic functions or box calls are very popular in the recommendation domain. For categorical features, we have to wrap in each, uh, you know, value into a single element array. So it can be, you know, collate into a, uh, a tensor format called the dragged sparse format, which is uh, the standard, uh, uh, one of the standard bo building blocks in the uh, PyTorch recommendation domain library. For dense features, uh, we will try to do a dense collation, which basically convert uh, a batch of data into a two-dimensional tensor with the batch size times uh, 13 in this case. Okay, so given this uh, pre pro logical in mind, uh, here is the example touch arrow program for criteria. So it represents each batch as a touch arrow data frame. And uh, uh, it first says, we want to fill the no value into both dense feature and the sparse feature. So an interesting note here is the both the dense uh, features and the sparse feature column is already nested struct. And we designed the touch arrow data frame API in a way that this was automatically do a column uh, Excel broadcasting behavior. So you don't have to iterate uh, over all the subfields, uh, but rather doing uh, one, one call. And similarly, as you can see, for the dense feature, we can do in a plus three and taking the log. The experience is designed to be very similar to a you know tensor, or in this case, it's more like a two-dimensional tensor because we have to broadcast for each uh, you know, subfield, subcolumn or subfield. Finally, uh, for the sparse feature, we will iterate over all the subfields and applying, you know, wrapping it into the single array uh, operation. Now, uh, so, so here I demonstrate the touch arrow program. Now, the next question is, how does that plug in into the PyTorch data loading to really serving the, uh, the data loading uh, perspective? And uh, so, to, to talk about that, let's first uh, go into how does the torch arrow uh, eager mode evaluation get implemented on a very high level. So this is the uh, uh, CPU backend, which is backed by the Velox. So uh, let's think about a very simple expression in torch arrow, like, uh, you know, we add two columns and then assign it to a new column. So what would happen under the hood? Each torch arrow column, such as DFA and DFB, uh, actually binds into Velox vector um, in the C++. In other words, it's represented by the uh, Velox vector. Um, in most cases in Torch Arrow, it's a flat vector, uh, which is which has a compatible format with arrow array. And then it needs to execute the uh, you know, add operator, right? So this operation is actually similar to the pi arrows, pi arrow computer functions. We will first need to construct a Velox expression set that represents this expression and wrapping the input vectors uh, into a row vector. And finally, Velox expression set supports evaluation over it with the given you know, vector inputs and the plus. So there was a uh, issue on the torch arrow, which uh, the issue itself is describing a slightly separate problem, but it uh, actually provides some more details about how does the CPU backend get implemented and how does that um, binds uh, into the low level C++ by log vector. So for that high level, it's actually very similar to uh, how, uh, you know, pi arrow and the pi arrow dot computer packages, uh, you know, trying to do, uh, try to expose to the Python ecosystem about these computer functions and the, you know, uh, column the representation. And we are indeed exploring uh, about how can we, you know, even bring the Velox and the arrow closer together in the Python world. Okay, now with the CPU eager mode, we do have a touch arrow eager evaluation that is, uh, you know, backed by the Velox, right? Then how do we really, uh, you know, uh, making the whole end-to-end, uh, -end, uh, you know, reading from the where reading from the files or warehouse, and then applying the pre proke and uh, feeding it to the trainer happen. Uh, so here is uh, here is the end-to-end -end workflow. So PyTorch uh, PyTorch data loader uh, v two.
provides a reading service abstraction. So this allows you to use some Python wrappers to connect with your warehouse. And uh, it can be a Python wrapper. It can also be some uh, more sophisticated uh, uh, service that supports, you know, for torrent. But uh, we, uh, we, because we use Arrow as a standard format, so the only contract in order to for Torch Arrow to use it is, at the end of the day, the reading service should need, need to be able to provide the iterable of Arrow table. And the reading service uh, can be, you know, your uh, commercialized warehouse solution, can be a CQ engine, or it can be a simple Python wrapper that's reading from uh, various uh, files on S3. And then, um, the Touch Arrow data frame supports the Arrow copy conversion from Arrow table. So now you can run the Python interpreter over this Touch Arrow program, uh, applying the applying the uh, pre proc and convert it to tensor and serve it to model. And uh, in this case, thinking about Touch Arrow is a Python layer glue, uh, Python layer glue that helps you connect your data with the underlying uh, Velox engine. Yeah. So. Uh, we have talked about uh, Arrow, Velox, and Touch Arrow. So the, the idea is we want to use the Apache Arrow as a standard uh, memory layout for column uh, data in the machine learning uh, side. And we want to use the Velox as a CPU evaluation library and as well as the UDF authoring. And finally, the Touch Arrow library, which is, which is inspired by the pandas style uh, you know, syntax. It allows you to glue those things together and allows research both researchers and the engineers to productionize their workload uh, into the into their warehouse. So, so far we have been talking about the eager mode. Eager mode is very great about prototyping and uh, you know putting some uh, and putting um, the initial prototype uh, together. And uh, it also provides reasonable performance because the, under the hood is a Velox engine. But again. Maybe we want to do more aggressive optimizations, like we want to do operator fusion, or you know, we can um, uh, like operator fusion or some kind of filter push down. So in this case, uh, we could uh, so 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 in order to support uh, this uh, in the meta, you know, internal scalability and uh, the efficiency, we actually we are we have uh, we have trying to use the trace mode. The idea is we want to trace. The program, for example, like this, um, into a some kind of IR. So with a standard relational IR, this opens opportunity to optimize and further lowering to other big data systems, uh, whether it's open source or some you know in-house build system, which is efficient, both efficient and scalable. And that's um, and 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 this mode actually demonstrate uh, can actually scale to the can satisfy even Meta's internal product scale and efficient requirement. And uh, we are still, uh, we, we, uh, we are in a very early stage about exploring if we can uh, also work together with the Arrow community about how can we uh, bring this together in to benefit the community about Torch Arrow and to kind of provide a more modular data loading experience in the AI world. So uh, with all this, Thanks everyone uh, for and and this is my presentation.